consider supporting this podcast on Patreon. On this episode of the What is Asia podcast, I interview Rolf Sieverston, a former history PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania, to talk about Korean political officials who operated in Manchukuo, as well as their experiences when they returned back to Korea after the fall of the Japanese puppet state in 1945. Rolf, thanks for joining us on this episode of the What is Asia podcast. Thank you for having me. So uh, you tackle a very unique topic here, which is Korean political officials who operated in Manchukuo, which is, uh, or was rather, a puppet state of Japan that was located in the northeast of China um, in their transition back to Korea. So to jump into this topic, I wanted to start by asking, can you describe uh, the role that these Korean political officials played in maintaining the functionality of the Manchukuo state government? And can you give just a little more context to who exactly these people were? Sure. So um, one of the really interesting things in that I, I sort of dealt with at the beginning of my research is trying to figure out, you know, precisely who, who these individuals were um, and why, you know, these colonized Koreans in particular decided to become directly involved in Japan's imperial project in Manchukuo. Um, and what I discovered is, well, first off, you know, this is actually a sizably, uh, a fairly sizable group of individuals. Um, at first it was rather small, only in the, in, the, in the hundreds or so, but by the 1940s there were over 10,000 Koreans in the Manchukuo bureaucracy. Um, and what I discovered is that Many of them were initially really motivated by a number of different uh, factors in colonial Korea at the time, particularly around uh, issues related to the job market. So, you know, these were uh, mostly elites, uh, members of colonial Korean society. They had had advanced education, uh, either in sort of some of the elite universities in Korea or in Japan. Some of them even educated uh, abroad in the United States uh, and Europe. Um, and it, you know, after the sort of economic crash in 1929 and the sort of dire economic conditions in Korea in the 1930s, a lot of them were facing, you know, some of the similar issues related to job prospects back in Korea after graduating from university. But then compounding that were uh, additional issues relating to, you know, uh, uh, workplace discrimination, them being uh, Koreans and most of their employers being Japanese. Um, issues surrounding uh, various, uh, you know, discrepancies in pay that Japanese were often paid more than Koreans. Um, and so a lot of them were really looking for opportunities to sort of express themselves as elites and, and sort of be elite members of society through their jobs that weren't available to them in Korea. And because of the way that Manchukuo was set up as sort of, uh, you know, as you mentioned, this puppet state, right, something that was supposedly, you know, presented to the global community as, uh, you know, an egalitarian version of sort of racial harmony, uh, where Koreans and uh, Chinese, Han Chinese, ethnic Manchus, uh, Russians could all sort of live together in society and be, you know, be a society of equals. That kind of propaganda really appealed to this particular realm of Korean society, segment of Korean society that was really interested in sort of uh, finding a way to, to sort of uh, be become actual elite members of, of society and having an actual practical impact on governance within Japanese imperial society. Um, and so that was one of the one of the major reasons that they decided to do uh, to do this. From the Japan the Japanese perspective, um, what's interesting is that they were you know interested in bringing Koreans in for a variety of reasons. Uh, one being sort of a popular conception among Japanese officials at the time that Koreans were more ethnically uh, Jap Japanized by this point uh, in the 1930s and particularly in the 1940s. Um, and so the, the many Japanese co officials considered Koreans to be you know, somewhat more uh, acceptable or manageable uh, as employees. And then the other issue is that uh, Manchukuo, uh, because of its location all, uh, with a 
along the Korean border um, and this sort of long history of migration across that border between Korea, uh, of Koreans um, and the large population of ethnic Koreans in uh, Northeast China dating back for centuries really. Um, once the Japanese set up this uh, colonial state in Manchukuo, they really had to figure out a way that they were going to deal with this ethnic Korean population. Um, and one of the strategies for doing that was in fact relying on a group of ethnic Korean bureaucrats who could more, they felt could more uh, be both sort of the political face of the new Manchukuo regime to this ethnic Korean population and also have, you know, have more experience uh, working with ethnic Koreans there. So the majority of the types of jobs that they worked in were particularly related to deal, uh, to managing the ethnic Korean population in Manchukuo. Um, most of them were regional government officials uh, located in particularly in these border regions uh, at the beginning. Uh, and then later on also really heavily involved in uh, the Japanese imperial government's uh, movement to uh, in encourage migration really of Korean agriculturalists and farmers into Manchuria to sort of grow Japan, uh, uh, expand rice production during wartime uh, to sort of feed Japan's imperial war uh, expansion. Um, and so these were sort of the major projects that they were involved in at the time. And so you talk about how many of these Koreans felt like uh, there were these imposed barriers on them that prevented social mobility. Did they feel like going to Manchukuo would help alleviate those barriers or did they, did they see some possibility of sort of working their way up the ladder and uh, finding Yeah, success? definitely. Um, sort of, uh, there was sort of this superficial level of propaganda that I think we, uh, those who have studied Manchukuo, you know, understand this discourse of racial harmony, you know, Gozoku Gyowa, the harmony of the five races was certainly there. But what's interesting is how this really sort of filtered into a lot of the institutional and legal structures of the state itself. Um, particularly when looking at the bureaucracy, uh, in 1938, the, um, they passed a civil service reform uh, act in Manchukuo that specifically stated that, you know, ethnic uh, discrimination based off of ethnic uh, or relig re ethnic, religious uh, or regional or clan ties was strictly prohibited for government employment. Um, and so these were things that, you know, were publicized in newspapers and were advertised in these sort of recruitment efforts that the Manchukuo government was, was sending to Korea that I think a lot of Koreans looked at and took seriously and said, you know, this is, this is something that I think is an, opportu an opportunity that we might not necessarily have in Korea. Um, and so that was, I think, a, a major motivating factor for them. Whether or not that actually was practiced, I think, is a much more complicated issue. Um, one of the uh, sort of anecdotes that I discovered in my research was the uh, there was there were three Koreans who were selected for the second class at an uh, institution called Daido Gakuin or the Great Unity Academy, which was this sort of central bureaucratic training institution in Manchukuo that was set up in 1932. And so the three Koreans who were in the second selected for the second class of this institution. Um, you know, went through this year-long process of getting them uh, after selection and getting them ready to become, you know, colonial bureaucrats and go out into the field. Um, and at the time, there was still actually, much like in Korea, a, a pay discrepancy between Japanese uh, government employees who were being paid a, a special stipend uh, that was given to them because it was sort of a... a might think of it as like hazard pay, that they were being sent out into a, a dangerous area and therefore they needed to get this extra bonus um, to help support their families while they were living in, in, in a dangerous situation that was not given to Koreans at the time. Um, and so while these Koreans were you know, together in these classes with Japanese and Ch other Chinese uh, future bureaucrats, we're having these conversations about how, you know, actually these kinds of, uh, this kind of pay discrepancy isn't really fair. And they went as far as to actually bring the head of the personnel bureau of the Manchukuo government into the class to sort of really lobby him and push for, uh, push for a change to these policies, uh, which were eventually rejected. And uh, as a result, actually two out of the three Koreans who had been uh, brought into this class refused to graduate and went back to Korea and only one of them completed. So this was sort of an ongoing issue for them uh, that, you know, there was definitely, I think, a mismatch between or, or a gap between 
the you know propaganda and the reality of what the bureaucracy was like. But it was still, I think, ev even with that, I think it was an attractive, uh, attractive opportunity for a lot of Koreans uh, that that really kind of motivated them to to make this decision. So Manchukuo collapses in 1945 at the conclusion of the Second World War, and so where did these political officials go? And what, for those who went back to Korea, what challenges did they encounter when going back to Korea? And then just to add an extension onto that, just sort of um, politically and um, just looking at the landscape of Korea, what, what was that environment like at that time? So there's sort of three questions packed into one. Yeah. Um there's sort of a number of different tracks that I've sort of uh, uh, been able to, trajectories I've sort of been able to track for some of these officials after 1945. Um, you know, most of the 10,000 that I mentioned before kind of disappear off the map uh, in 1945, and it was very difficult to track them. Uh, some of them, I know for certain, stayed in Manchuria. Um, one of the interesting aspects of there being this large ethnic Korean population in, in Northeast China at the time is some of, the, some of them were ethnic Koreans were actually recruited who, uh, from this group of people who, you know, they were actually born and raised in China their entire lives. Um, and so at the conclusion of World War II, you know, many of them may have simply decided to stay in these local communities, since that's where they were from. Uh, a large portion, actually, of the individuals who were recruited into the Japanese, uh, the Manchukuo bureaucracy, were in fact from Northern Korea, which makes sense because, just because of the close regional proximity between the two. Um, so after the war, uh, the majority, I, my assumption is that the majority of them returned to their hometowns, which were in Northern Korea. They have been somewhat harder for me to keep track of just because of the lack of source material in North Korea. Although I have been able to find uh, accounts of some who first went to the North and then eventually migrated to the South because of political conditions. Uh, or there were in fact, even some of these former Manchukuo bureaucrats who became fairly prominent uh, members of society in North Korea, particularly in the 1940s and 1950s, um, and some well into the 1960s and 70s. Um, the majority of my dissertation research, though, focuses on individuals who return to South Korea. That's sort of the largest group that I've been able to keep track of. And returning to South Korea was really, an, I think, an interesting experience for many of these men, because they came back having what I would really describe as kind of a unique experience working as colonial bureaucrats in Manchukuo which was quite different from you know, being, for example, a, a regional magistrate in Korea during the colonial period afterwards. Um, they faced uh, a number of, they actually had a number of advantages, I think, in dealing with some of the aspects of post-colonial society, uh, both probably in North Korea, but as, as well as in South Korea. One being that you know, uh, many Koreans coming out of this colonial moment are, in a position where they really want to pursue a, a kind of post-colonial justice, right? Where we need to, they needed to find those who had collaborated with the Japanese and, and you know, uh, meet out some kind of punishment that they felt was acceptable for having, uh, having collaborated with Japanese during the colonial period. Um, now, th for a variety of reasons, these, uh, a number of these attempts kind of fell apart in South Korea in the 1940s. Um, but there were there was still a concerted movement to to mete out some punishment for collaborators. But what's interesting about these former Manchuko officials is there really wasn't very much information available on them in the South at the time. And so a number of them were kind of relatively easily able to fly under the radar for um, for these kinds of political purges. Uh, but at the same time, this was kind of a double-edged sword. The fact that they weren't particularly well known in Korean society, uh, at the end of World War II made it uh, actually kind of difficult for many of them to find employment, uh, particularly for those who were looking at getting back into government service in some way, um, just because of the way the, the nature of how the recruitment system was set up by the Americans during the US occupation. Um, there really was kind of a, a desire among the Americans to just sort of keep those Koreans who had been working in, in a lot of these positions under the Japanese colonial government in the, in the positions that they were already working in, simply because the US didn't have enough personnel to run the government on their own without this kind of support, particularly after they sent the Japanese back, uh, back to Japan. 
And so these Koreans who were coming from Manchukuo didn't really have the, kind, the same kind of institutional support that, uh, and connections that say uh, someone who had been working in the Japanese colonial government in Korea at the time uh, might have had. So it was much more difficult, I think, for some of them uh, to, to get, uh, get employment in the government. Um, and so the types of jobs that, that they did get really tended to focus in a few specific kinds of areas, um, particularly very tech highly technical jobs uh, around uh, particularly agricultural uh, technology and agricultural practices. Um, the police force was another interesting area where a lot of them, uh, not, a, not a lot of them uh, found employment, but the ones who did were particularly successful in the 1940s. Um, this was uh, particularly, I think, uh, influential in the first few years uh, as sort of the uh, American and South Korean uh, push against the development of communism in, uh, in South Korea was, was particularly heightened um, because many of these Korean bureaucrats who had been, uh, you know, say local police officers uh, or even police, uh, police trainers in Manchukuo had uh, experience with things like anti-insurgency tactics where in the Korean border, or in the Manchukuo Korean border regions, they had been going after some of these very same, uh, you know, Korean communist groups that they were then fighting again in the post-war Cold War period. Um, so that was, uh, that was another one of the areas that they really kind of, kind of found, uh, found their mark. But in general, a lot of them really uh, struggled to, uh, find a foothold in society, basically because they didn't really constitute a, a single political group. They were really kind of atomized uh, and marginalized and really just only able to sort of gain traction by attaching themselves to these other more dominant political forces that were arising in South Korea at the time. Mm -hmm. And maybe this is a little too specific of a question, but of these Koreans that came back and were able to find jobs and implement these state building projects that aim to improve Korean society. Um, were these people, how were they understood among the Korean population? Were they highly revered? And were there ever instances of uh, the population finding out that one of these officials were collaborators and that uh, result in, you know, like a riot or, or a scuffle of any kind, if, if you happen to have any information on that? Yeah, it's, what's interesting is that from the research I've done, I haven't really found a lot of sort of public discussion of the part surrounding the particular issue of collaboration in Manchukuo. Um, you know, in general, I would say most Koreans were, were not aware of what had gone on in Manchukuo, um, particularly in the South. I think the, the situation may have been somewhat different in the North where, you know, regionally it was closer, there was more back and forth across the border. But for people who had been living in the South uh, throughout the colonial period, I don't think there was as much knowledge of what, what life had been like in Manchukuo other than what the Japanese propaganda was. Um, and so most of the sort of uh, negative uh, pub publicity really, uh, or that, that former Manchukuo bureaucrats really faced was from Koreans who had been living in Manchukuo and had and knew about what life was like there and had sort of been exposed to um, and and sort of challenged uh, the uh, these bureaucrats who were Koreans who were also bureaucrats in the Manchukuo government um, and so you know I found instances of articles actually complaining about how the uh, South Korean government and South Korean society is is really ignoring the fact that there was this group of collaborate, Korean collaborators who were in Manchukuo and did these terrible things to their fellow Koreans and were equally, you know, involved in Japanese imperialism. And yet they're still, in, you know, still in their positions. They're still working for the government with impunity and not being punished for it. And that, you know, the government needed to take concerted efforts to actually punish not just collaborators who had been collaborating in Korea, but elsewhere within the Japanese empire too. Um, but in general, these were actually quite rare cases that these were stated publicly. Um, you know, in the process of developing a number of these anti-collaborator laws in the 1940s, uh, the, what's interesting is that initially uh, I, I found a lot of language that speci specifically highlighted groups that were in Manchukuo that should be classified as collaborators and, and should be punished according to, in various ways. But through the process of negotiation with these bills uh, and, and as they go into law and become enforced, it really gets sort of watered down and any mention of Manchukuo eventually disappears by the time that they're actually uh, 
by the time you get to the final version, basically. Um, and so it, it's really interesting to me that, that sort of, it's something that was very conscious that I think particularly individuals who had experience and knowledge of what life was like in Manchuko um, were motivated to do something about, it, but really wasn't, never really captured, I think, the, the zeitgeist of, of the moment um, in South Korean society, the way, uh, for example, you know, the issue of collaboration for people who were nearby. You know, it's one thing if it's your neighbor, but if it's someone who, you know, was born in the North, you never, that was not well known in the South to begin with, and then had gone to Manchuko, you know, it's, it's kind of a different, different issue entirely. And you know, in your research that um, these Korean political officials who came back and who happened to have uh, a, um, these communist sentiments, they favored uh, uh, communist ideas over uh, these typical Western capitalist ideas. And those people ended up being denied, largely being denied work in the Korean government upon their return. I wonder if uh, at the outbreak of the Korean War, if a lot of these Koreans with communist sentiments migrated up to the North and did they become important political actors in the development of the early North Korean state? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question that I would like to know more about myself. Um, I know, I know for a fact that there were, uh, there were a small handful uh, who, who definitely did go, whether willingly or unwillingly, it's difficult to tell, to the North during the Korean War. Um, and I would just sort of qualify a little bit the, the characterization of some of these as having communist uh, sympathies. Um, I think it, there's really kind of a broad spectrum of the kinds of political beliefs that a number of these men held. Uh, particularly if we're sort of thinking about the spectrum on the left end. Um, some were very adamant communists, um, and those, were the, those, I think, were the individuals who particularly migrated to the North um, before the Korean War. Um, you know, I, there uh, are a few individuals who particularly became prominent uh, members of the North Korean political institution, uh, particularly in uh, economic uh, economic mobilization and economic development programs uh, in North Korea in the 1950s. And, and all of these men, to my knowledge, uh, even though they initially uh, migrated to the South after 1945, uh, all of them ended up going to the North within basically the first two years of the US occupation. Um, but uh, as far as the, the, those who came sort of during or after the Korean War, it's much more difficult to tell how, how their sort of careers developed afterwards. Um, I haven't really been able to keep track of them very well. But even for those who, who didn't, um, there were still a fairly sizable group who had what we might sort of think is sort of socialist leaning or social democrats or democratic socialists who continued to work in, in South Korea well through the 1950s um, and into the 1960s. And I would say that, you know, it's, it, what, was, what is interesting to me is that despite having sort of these tendencies that we, what we may, might think of as more on the political left, at a time when anti-communism was very heightened in, in South Korean politics, you know, a lot of them still did have go held government positions. Um, I, I mentioned one individual, Lee Gi-hong, who uh, was basically uh, accused of being a, a Communist Party member just before the beginning of the Korean War, uh, who uh, actually ended up continuing to work in a government position for the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry well into the 1960s. Um, so clearly that, you know, the mere fact of being accused of being a communist uh, in South Korea wasn't a complete detriment to one's career. Um, at the same time, he really never was promoted beyond, uh, above that position. He just sort of moved around to different positions within the, the government for the rest of his career, uh, or at least until uh, the presidency of Park Chung hee when things changed a little bit. Um, but uh, what's interesting to me is that, you know, th these kinds of ideas that they had uh, that were inspired by, uh, you know, socialism and communism um, and what we might think of more as more like sort of uh, corporatist ideas about government, uh, government direction and economic regulation uh, were still very much a part of the conversation throughout the 1950s. Um, even as, you know, a lot of the rhetoric was sort of more involved around ideas of, uh, you know, divesting uh, of government uh, government corporations, divesting government property and funneling a lot of that into industrial development. You know, a number of these men were still talking about uh, 
deep and deeply involved in attempts to uh, organize uh, agricultural production through cooperative farming movements and things like that, um, that were what we would think of more, I think, along the lines of, uh, of sort of socialist development practices that were popular, particularly in the early Soviet Union. Um, and so, yeah, again, these, these were, my, my perspective, I think, on the 1950s is that, in fact, it, it was a fairly dynamic period when a lot of these ideas were allowed to, to commingle, uh, even if they were sort of somewhat in the background and not necessarily the dominant, dominant uh, strain in South Korean politics. Mm -hmm. And I just had a couple more questions before we wrapped up here, one of which is in your time doing research for this project, uh, did you ever gain a sense of what the legacy of this history of former Manchukuo officials coming back to Korea was? Is there a certain way that it's understood now or talked about now that was striking to you in any way? Um, yeah, so one of the things that, that I, I, the sort of underlying historiographic arguments that I've been trying to make with my research is that there's really a, a a common uh, argument out there or, or, or an argument out there that states that, um, you know, particularly focused around uh, the rise of Park Chung-hee and sort of the mili his military clique who had this experience as military uh, officers and officials in Manchuria in the 1940s, um, that there's, there's some kind of connection between, you know, the authoritarian style economic developmental programs that were established in South Korea in the 1960s and 70s and this unique experience of state development and imperial development in Manchukuo in the 1930s and 1940s, um, to the to the point where there you know there are even some that have argued that you know South Korean developmental society is is kind of defined by a number of different characteristics and institutional programs that come directly from Manchukuo. And what I've really found by looking specifically at a number of these individuals very closely and tracking their their sort of political trajectories from the 1930s all the way up to the 1960s is that really the legacy of Manchukuo is quite varied and that it didn't really mean the same thing to, uh, to these individuals in any, in any given respect. And that while in, from my research, I've really been able to show that they had a very sort of uniform uh, experience in Manchukuo that created a very specific kind of identity about what it meant to be a Manchukuo bureaucrat that really lasted for a long time and really uh, helped kind of bind them together as, an, as a group, both as Koreans and even sort of with their former uh, Manchukuo bureaucrat colleagues in Japan. Um, on an individual level, they really kind of grappled with what this meaning meant in uh, the post-colonial moment and really kind of went through what I argue is a process of, of uh, sort of conditional decolonization where, uh, particularly because they were kind of marginalized within the political establishment, they really grappled with what the meaning of Manchukuo was and what the sort of lessons they could draw from it were and tried to integrate those with more dominant trends, particularly, uh, you know, collaborating with, uh, with American economic thinkers as well as American, the American aid program in a number of different ways to try and develop programs that would advance what was the really basic elements of what they saw as state development at the time. And I think there were a few kind of uniform things that maybe we can draw out of that. Uh, one being that in general, they all really adhered to this idea that the state held a preeminent role in, uh, in economic and social development uh, in the modern nation state. That, uh, you know, ideas about sort of uh, liberalism, economic freedom, you know, li liaison affaire, economics, uh, market driven economics really did not appeal to the, most of them in any way. And that most of the programs that they championed were really focused on state-driven uh, state driven development and state-driven uh, social programs. Um, and so related to that sort of is many of them were very skeptical of, of capitalism as sort of uh, an organizing principle. Uh, and then finally, I would say that, uh, you know, another major aspect was that a number of them were, one aspect of Manchukuo society that really uh, was really reinforced through their, uh, their education program, training programs uh, and recruitment programs was militarization. Um, and so that a number, uh, well, I would say that well into the 1950s and particularly after the Korean War, another aspect that a number of them uh, sort of really grappled with was 
what role the military should play in society and what, uh, what role sort of self-defense plays in socioeconomic developmental programs. And this I think is sort of key to understanding why a fairly substantial portion of them ended up uh, working with Pak Chung-hee and the sort of military, former Men Chu Ko military clique in the 1960s, um, advancing that kind of uh, economic development program, at least initially. Uh, sort of in the long term, a number of them kind of had a falling out with Pak Chung-hee, uh, but that's kind of a longer, a longer history. And if anyone is listening to this podcast and they think to themselves, I want to know more about these Korean officials who were operating in Manchukuo. I want to know more about um, this period between the end of World War II and the beginning of the Korean War. Uh, could you recommend maybe one or two books that you would suggest someone read? Yeah, I would definitely recommend uh, Carter Eckert's book, uh, his the first volume of his biography of Pak Chung Yi. Um, uh, I think, believe it's called. Uh, is it Park, Park Jung -hee and Modern Korea, The Roots of Militarism, um, which uh, really focuses on uh, really a deep dive into the military culture of the Manchukuo military that Park Jung -hee experienced as a military officer. Um, and while I think I take a somewhat different uh, approach to it with my own research, looking at the civil bureaucracy, I nonetheless think it's a, it's a really interesting uh, vision of what the kinds of institutions that were developing in Manchukuo in the 1930s and 1940s, um, and how Koreans really interacted with and experienced those, and uh, and sort of uh, looking towards how those really shaped political and social developments in particularly in South Korea after 1945. Um, another uh, reading I would also recommend is a, a an article by Pak Tae Gyun uh, from Seoul National University. Uh, I think it's from 2005 called uh, Different Roads, Common Destinations, Economic Discourses in South Korea during the 1950s, uh, which really, I think, does a good job of painting a picture of what I kind of mentioned earlier, of the kind of diversity of, of intellectual discourse that was going on around economic issues in South Korea in the 1950s, and, and looking at how, you know, there were sort of a variety of different groups and opinions that were floating around in South Korean uh, government and uh, academic and intellectual circles at the time that I think particularly some of which go underappreciated and really kind of are an interesting vision of how sort of the transition between the colonial moment and the post-colonial moment uh, and then leading into sort of more what we think of as the developmental era of South Korea in the 1960s um, where the 1950s really fit in in that that historical discussion. Great. Well, Rolf, thank you for joining us on this episode of the What is Asia podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, for those in the audience watching or listening to this, you can go onto our YouTube channel, the What is Asia podcast for more content or go to nakotadefonso.com. We'll see you in the next episode. Mm -hmm.